uh, my name is Danny. Uh, I am speaking with, together with Sage today about storage security in a critical enterprise OpenStack environment. Um, I'm uh, working for Deutsche Telekom, um, uh, mainly as a Ceph developer and uh, also uh, on contributing to OpenStack and um, yeah. So let's give a short overview. We will talk about uh, what we do at Deutsche Telekom to have a secure NFV cloud, um, what are our requirements, and after that about uh, attack surfaces we have um, identified and um, in the other parts about uh, countermeasures, proactive and reactive, and at the end, uh, the conclusions. So, um, what we try at Deutsche Telekom is building an NFE cloud for our uh, telco core, um, and we have for that uh, um, a data center design and have two types of data centers. Uh, one is a BDC, it's a back-end data center, there are only a few in this example in Germany, for example, and um, these are more classic data centers. We have uh, high SLAs and uh, for the infrastructure and for the services, so uh, including fire departments and all that, uh, the usual stuff. And on the other hand, we serve um, dot services, the are very critical, uh, containing also private and customer data, and um, therefore need this uh, high SLA requirements. And on the other hand, we have the front-end data centers. We have, in this case, uh, many front-end data centers, uh, but they are very small. They are near to the customer to provide the services as near as possible to be fast, and um, they have very low, uh, or let's say lower SLAs, and what uh, we do is, uh, what we expect, they can fail at any time. So the services itself that is running in these data centers are responsible for providing the service and switch over. Um, the services are spread about um, many data centers and have to handle the, the errors in the infrastructure. Um, as you can imagine, on a, a telco core, we have uh, very high security requirements. Um, Therefore, we build our cloud with multiple placement zones, in this case, as security zones. And uh, we have there, for example, the, the classic stuff like uh, the DMZ or the MZ and security zones and management zones. Um, if you want to have a deeper look into that, um, there's a use case uh, if from the Telco Working Group describing uh, what we are doing. So due to the... Um, Placement zones, we need separations for uh, compute network and storage, obviously. Um, each of these zones can use storage, but may don't use it. So um, that's, it's in open, but we expect for this setup to have storage in each of them. Um, the setup needs to uh, protect us against uh, various um, attack vectors. And the um, product or the rollout is uh, enforced and re uh, reviewed by the security uh, department. Uh, so we have to convince them that the setup is uh, secure. Um, um, where do we have a connection between OpenStack and Ceph? Um, on one hand, we have uh, the object servers uh, S3 or uh, OpenStack Swift interfaces. Um, that uh, setup may make use of Keystone for our user authentication. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, Cinder with libRBD, clearly, um, and Glance as an image store, um, which may use RBD or may use uh, an object store uh, in the back end. Uh, clearly, we have Nova to run the uh, services and uh, the hypervisor. And on the other hand, we have Manila, uh, there it's uh, a little bit unclear which component of um, OpenStack, uh, which component of Ceph will be used uh, between Manila and the CephFS. That's, uh, there we will find the solution and discussing that. And yeah, what components of Ceph do we have? On the, on the uh, red block, we have Rados that's responsible for all the handling of the cluster, enabling the racks, and uh, responsible for distributing the data and backfilling if something is failing. And um, 
on top of that, we have uh, three main components um, in Ceph, and that's uh, the Rouse Gateway that's providing a S3 or Swift interface to uh, object store. Um, and we have RBD, a block device, um, to provide block for VMs. And on the other hand, we have CephFS providing a distributed file system. Um, the main problem is um, how to do the separation between the security zones in this case, uh, especially for storage. On one hand, you can simply build physical separation and uh, build for each security zone a Ceph own Ceph cluster. That uh, would mean in our setup we have uh, at least 20 uh, front-end data centers, and uh, that would mean a high number of clusters we have to maintain, and that's um, obviously need a lot of hardware um, and a lot of maintenance effort uh, and would be taken us a lot of flexibility that's provided by uh, Ceph. Um, the alternative would be to use uh, Rados pools, um, um, which is more flexible and would allow us to use our hardware, especially since we have only the, the front end setters, for example, are very small, so um, it, it's uh, much more efficient to uh, use. And the real question for our uh, security department in this case is, is clearly, will provide us a pool separation, the same security as the physical uh, separation. And that's all, um, all the problem we have um, currently. And um, the idea is to have for each security zone uh, an own RADOS pool um, and limit the access to these pools depending on the security and key management available in Ceph itself. On the OpenStack side, we would use availability zones to uh, build these uh, placement zones. And obviously, we have three main components we have to handle, and this, uh, one is Cinder. Uh, in Cinder, uh, we plan to use it um, a own backend for each um, pool with an own authentication key uh, to provide the zone. and. Um, the problem here is that, in general, uh, we're missing in OpenStack a policy, a, a way to force uh, a hard mapping between the availability zone and the storage backend, in this case. Um, currently, it could be done by accident that somebody is matching the wrong, uh, back, uh, the wrong volume to a Cinder uh, availability zone. And the other problem or a component is, in this case, Glance. And um, there we have the problem that there is a lack of separation between the control and the uh, compute storage layer. So if you have multiple backends and only one uh, glance instance, then we have obviously a component or a VM that is running and have contact to the complete or access to the complete or storage cluster, and that is something we don't want. Um, Manila, um, we currently don't use or plan to use in production because simply ZFFS itself is not uh, really production ready, but maybe in the future we could uh, alternatively use uh, RBD with uh, NFS to provide shared storage. Yeah, what, which attack services we have? And there is a case of Rados Gateway. Um, the 10 end VM has only access to the gateway. It has no access to the storage components like the OSDs or the uh, monitors uh, from Ceph. Um, there is no direct access or, of the customer and the VM to this part of Ceph. But uh, due to the fact that it's all uh, HTTP or HTTPS, it's a single API you can attack. That's uh, still a problem. Um, for RBD, um, that's, yeah, let's say uh, more secure at the moment because you have the hypervisor in between and there is no network access from the client. The uh, client don't care about from where the block device is coming and don't see the network in this case. But the issue here is, uh, as seen more than once, the uh, hypervisor is not, it's still software and software uh, is not 100% secure so somebody could break out and would have on the host direct access to everything. Um, from the host perspective, um, as soon as KVM or whatever hypervisor you use is uh, compromised, the attacker has uh, access to the neighbor VMs um, in, on the same machine, 
and it has access to the local authentication keys for CEF, and um, therefore it has also access to the public network and, and the uh, OSD3 demons that run these public networks. So uh, that would be an attack uh, vector in this case, and you might think you could uh, handle that with a firewall or a deep, uh, deep package inspection, but um, from our perspective, that's partly impractical because of the use protocol. So the most uh, traffic going uh, through SAF or the network at the end is uh, binary blobs, and uh, you can't filter that that easily. So, and it would also have a uh, Im implication to performance and costs in this case. And uh, since NFV is uh, a lot of about performance on the network side, that would uh, cost us too much. So the issue at the end is that the SAF itself need to be resistant against uh, attacks. And the problem is that uh, C or C++ is a lot harder to secure than uh, Python in this case. And the problem is also if you have only one uh, security flaw in one of the demons, you have it in a complete cluster. So you could always attack the complete cluster in this case. Uh, from the network side, um, the problem is made that the traffic between the cluster and the, um, and the cl uh, client is not encrypted. So, um, in theory, a sniffer could read all traffic that's going over that and uh, could maybe change, uh, sh sh at least read uh, all data, maybe uh, recover and write something. Uh, the session itself between the client and the cluster are authenticated, so the attacker can't uh, run a man-in-the-middle attacks or impersonate a client or a server in this case that would be considered safe. Yeah, and we have for sure denial of service, and um, there you could, uh, could uh, submit as an attacker large or many small I.O. and uh, take the cluster out this way. So you may have to use uh, QEMU I.O. throttling to mitigate that. Uh, on the other hand, you could also open a lot of connections that um, bring down the cluster or block something. And yeah, for sure you could crash the cluster uh, if you find a flaw. Um, so maybe there are also other expensive uh, features in, in Ceph or the uh, interface that could be used to run a denial of service attack. So what, what can we do against that? Uh, in general, for the deployment, the usual stuff uh, uh, in general uh, applies, that meaning um, have strong keys and uh, make sure that nobody is getting into your machine uh, in general. That's, I don't want to go too deep in that because um, that is something you always have for each of the machines, also for compute. Uh, on the network side, it's crucial to run always uh, separated cluster and uh, public network. Um, don't give uh, any compute node or any component that don't need access to the cluster network any possibility to connect. Um, and you always make, have to make sure that you separate your control, control nodes from other networks um, because the control nodes uh, have made keys and uh, that uh, are not supposed to be used uh, outside and uh, opens new attack vectors. And, um, yeah, for sure you don't expose these uh, networks to the internet, uh, to the open internet. And if you have to run interdata center traffic, then you have to encrypt it. And um, very important for us is we don't run any uh, hyper-converged infrastructure. It's very obvious that if you have multiple data security zones, you don't want to do that because um, you uh, run in problems if you have, for example, to migrate uh, or shut down and uh, compute node and bring parts of the cluster down, and um, you have always risks to mix something up. And also don't uh, mix uh, the control nodes between self and OpenStack. For the Rados gateway, we have a way to, okay. Uh, for the, for the RLS gateway, the problem is that you have an easy target. I mean, that's HTTP and uh, it's a REST interface. There are ways to attack that. Um, you, have an, a web, uh, you have a web server uh, and uh, you also can attack that. And uh, what we do is um, usually you have uh, direct access from the tenant VM to the RLS gateway through an, uh, not, to an IP that is not part of the public or the cluster network. Uh, what we do is um, we run a small 
proxy appliance uh, between the router's gateway and the tenant VM, in this case uh, to protect the router's gateway. And uh, the uh, appliance uh, has a separated network um, and is SSL terminated. And within the proxy, we run a, a web application firewall, in this case, uh, mod security. Uh, to make sure that, for example, the user can only assess or send an API call uh, or REST call only to, for example, his user and his buckets, uh, and also filter other stuff out uh, you have uh, usually there. And um, this is a service from the infrastructure in this case, and it will be run in a, in a secured or managed zone that is not part of the other um, of the other uh, zones that the tenant is running. So, and it's very crucial that you don't share uh, buckets and users between uh, tenants. You can share it within the tenant, but not uh, to the outside. So I hand over to Sage. Hello. Um, all right, so as, as Danny described, um, there are only so many things you can do before you actually have to rely on Ceph itself to enforce the, the security that it's reporting to provide. Um, so the, the mechanism that we use in Ceph to do this is called CephX. It's actually a pluggable infrastructure, but Ceph is, CephX is the one implementation that we actually use. Um, and the, the overall design is modeled um, after Kerberos, but sort of integrated tightly with Ceph and designed to be highly available, distributed, so forth. Um, so the key ideas are that the monitors are the trusted key servers. This is a, similar to your Kerberos KDC um, that you'd have in a traditional environment. So they have copies of all the keys for the daemons and also the clients that are accessing the cluster. Um, and each key associated with it has a capability that, that describes what that key is authorized to do. So which pools it can read and write from and, and what, what, operation, it, what operations it can do on those objects. Um, so overall, what Ceph provides is um, mutual authentication of client and server. So the client knows that the server also has a copy of its secret key, and the server knows that the client has a copy of the key that it has stored. So you can avoid man in the middle in that case. Um, it also gives you um, an extensible framework with these capabilities, so you can describe in plain text um, different types of services and, and different ways to restrict access, um, at least within the overall framework. Um, and, and you can prevent these man-in-the-middle attacks. And what you don't get from CephX is, is secrecy. So um, the authentication protocol is smart so that a sniffer can't recover any of the keys used, um, but, it, but it sends act, the actual data that gets sent plain text, so you can see the reads and writes that are going by. Um, so sort of the takeaways from this are that um, obviously the monitors have to be secured since they store all of the cluster keys. Um, so you want to put those on separate hosts and make sure they're hardened security-wise and so forth. Um, you also have to be really careful in managing the Ceph keys, um, how they're distributed and so forth. So um, in, in this case, we're going to have a separate sender key for each of the different security zones um, and each of those sender backends. Um, and so the VM that has that key can only access that particular security zone, obviously, and you restrict the capabilities that that, that key can actually do. Um, but sort of on the other side, also, you have to limit the administrator's power, too. So if you have um, you know, random employees who are responsible for administering your cloud, um, you can grant them access to administer the Ceph cluster, but, for example, not be able to actually administer the authentication keys to grant other, other keys access and so forth, and you can revoke access um, that way. So these are existing features that you can make use of. And obviously, you want to be just very careful with how you distribute those keys. So if you're using you know, puppet modules that are or something that's distributing those keys to the actual nodes where um, and KVM is running and authenticating and so forth. You want to make sure that only the keys that are necessary are actually getting copied around. Um, but obviously, there are some things um, that we also want to do as well. Um, so CephX was modeled after Kerberos um, in part because we should sort of keep piggyback on the authentication um, and crypto that they're doing, and so we can sort of use a known good model. Um, but code has only been reviewed by Ceph developers, so one of the key things we're doing now is bringing in external security exports to do um, additional review of that code to make sure that it's sort of doing what we think it's doing. Um, on the OpenStack side, you need to do the same thing um, to make sure that the, the deployment tools um, are distributing the keys properly and actually not copying them into bad places. Um, and sort of across the board, we want to improve the quality of the documentation so that people who are actually deploying these clouds um, can actually see clear descriptions of what the best practices are and how um, security capabilities should be defined and so forth, because um, it's, it's not obvious. Um, but even assuming all of that works, um, you know, Ceph is software, software can have flaws, so how do we, how do we mitigate that? Um, so one of the first things we want to do is sort of reduce the number of bugs or <laughs> do as, as much as possible um, the flaws that we have in Ceph itself. Um, so one of the key tools we use to do that is through the use of static code analysis. So this is software that reads your code and understands it and tries to find bugs. Um, one of the main tools we use for that is Coverity, um, which is sort of one of the, one of the best in the industry. Um, they have this great project um, that they've hosted for a couple of years now that um, scans all, 
um, open source projects, and it's all posted online, it's all for free. So Ceph has been doing this for two years now, and we fixed almost a thousand issues, uh, many of those um, by, by Danny here, who's worked sort of tirelessly to do this. Um, we whitelisted a bunch of sort of non-issues. Um, there are some outstanding issues that we still need to address. And there are some other tools also that are open source. There's CPP check and um, uh, Clang and LLVM um, have tools as well that, that can do this. Um, there's also runtime analysis, so we use tools like um, Valgrind and our automated QA that, that looks for you know, use after free and buffer overruns and all that good stuff um, to make sure we're not doing anything stupid. Um, and that's, that's done wonders for, for stability across the board. Um, but there's more that we can do. So one, one thing that we need to do is reduce the backlog of low priority issues in Coverity so that um, we can separate out all the noise. There's a bunch of issues in all the test code that we don't care about, but it makes it hard to see the real issues. Um, so cleaning all of that up. Um, we want to have automatic reporting um, of um, SCA regressions when people submit a pull request. Um, currently, we, we do scans every couple of days, and so you catch it pretty quickly after it's merged, but we want to catch it before it actually makes it into the tree uh, or anywhere near a uh, release. Um, and as part of that process, just overall improve the awareness um, among the Ceph developer community of, of the impact of their code changes to security um, so that we can sort of prevent these design issues and, and code flaws before they happen. Um, this, this sort of human element of just um, being aware <laughs> and being careful is, is critical. Um, so um, sort of the next step is actually going through and having a sort of a trained security professional go through and do penetration testing against Ceph and actually, you know, you, you do a review of the code and you look at how the algorithm works and then you actually go and you try to, you try to subvert that security by injecting bad um, information and trying to test all the corner cases in the security code and so forth. Um, that's, that's a very um, high cost um, approach and sort of challenging, so you have to have somebody who's trained to do it and you have to have guidance from somebody who actually knows the Ceph code and to make sure they're actually using, spending their time well. Um, but it's a, a necessary part of the puzzle. Um, fuzz testing sort of goes along with that where you actually use a computer to generate random inputs and just sort of spray it at interfaces and make sure, you, see if you can make it crash or misbehave and overflow buffers and so forth. Um, but there are, there are other things that we can do that are sort of uh, much easier and that we're working on right now. Um, one of those is just simply hardening the build. There are all these um, features in the kernel and the build tools that um, make it much harder for people to exploit sort of traditional buffer overflow type, type vulnerabilities. So F and F pick randomized location of, of code when it's loaded into memory so you can't sort of predictably know where the code, um, the pointers are going to be um, when you're trying to, trying to subvert a program. Um, Fortify source validates um, format type information and does some other sort of compile time checks. Stack Protector Strong has all these um, compiler feature that implements all this stuff so that if you try to blow, a, blow out a stack frame, um, which is sort of a common uh, method of attack, um, it'll, it'll detect that and cause a seg fault instead of letting you sort of do, do bad things. Um, RelRO is um, the indirection table when you load dynamic code. It marks that read-only at a very early stage so that you can't sort of dynamically rewrite code later after runtime. Um, and of course, when you're doing all this, you want to make sure that implementing all these features doesn't make everything go slower because that, that can be problematic in a cluster. But um, in generally, there, there's um, one of the nice things is that in enterprise distributions, um, a lot of these features are sort of um, enabled by default in the build tools. So some of some people running Ceph today already have all this stuff enabled. We're working on getting it enabled for everybody else and make sure that it's all sort of well, well handled and so forth. Um, but even so, you know, you do everything you can to try to prevent bugs. Um, some of them are going to happen anyway. So how do you mitigate the, the breach if that actually does happen? So one of the key things that we're doing now is making it so that all the Ceph daemons don't run as root. Um, they run as sort of a, just a Ceph user that has much limited permissions, um, so they can't actually root the box. Um, this work is pending for Infernalis, which is the next um, community release coming up in a couple months. Um, another big tool here is the use of mandatory access control. So tools like SE Linux and AppArmor um, that further restrict the, the things that a process is sort of allowed to do and known to do um, in its normal course of action. So if you stray outside that, it'll raise security alerts and, and cause failures and so forth. Um, that's also sort of in progress right now. At least on the SE Linux front, I assume that there's AppArmor stuff um, going on as well. Um, other, there are some other things you can do as well. Um, some of the Ceph daemons that are, that are lighter weight and less resource intensive, you can just run NVM. So if, even if you break out of the daemon, you don't um, you know, have a fully privileged um, root account or whatever on the host. Um, so that, that might work for the monitor and the radius gateway. Um, it's, it's less feasible for the OSD because it's much more performance sensitive and needs to talk directly to hardware. Um, so you probably wouldn't use it there. Um, but a, a key thing is that um, we want to make sure that the, all the networks that are used for sort of doing actual client I.O. and actually nor normally operating the cluster are separate from the ones that are used to manage the cluster. Um, currently, the monitor sort of shares all of it on the same interface, and we want to separate that so you can very carefully control um, the management activity, which needs to be blocked down much more carefully. 
Um, encryption obviously becomes part of this picture. Um, data at rest encryption is sort of the first piece of this. Um, it's almost less a, a, an attack vector um, as a, a management thing. Um, so the, the Ceph disk tool allows you to layer in de-encrypt on top of raw disks um, automatically when you're provisioning Ceph um, to encrypt the raw block devices. And the key thing that this is actually used for is just so that when, you're, when a disk fails or if you want to arm a disk, you can actually take that disk and safely discard it without running it through a shredder. Um, or if somebody walks into your data center and grabs a disk, they won't, they won't actually have um, unencrypted data. Um, but that's sort of a, that's a different threat vector. Um, the, the challenge right now is that the, the key management that we currently implement is very simple. We're just putting the keys in a, on a different disk in the same host. Um, and so the, the key thing that, we're, that we need to do is use better key management. Um, the, our current plan is to use a new project called Patera, which is a new key escrow project from the security folks at Red Hat um, that looks super cool. It's very elegant and much better than what we sort of had in mind. Um, it is a new dependency, but um, it's very lightweight and small and easy to use. So that's, that's the current path forward. Um, we might also also use the uh, have an alternative simple key management that just uses the existing monitors to manage those keys. But um, I think we, we we like Patera much better, so that's probably the path forward. Um, so ignoring on disk, um, there's also encryption over the wire. Um, as you mentioned before, Ceph is careful about not letting you recover your encryption keys, um, but the actual data reads and writes are sent over the wire. Um, so you want to protect the data from someone who's listening on that network. Um, the other sort of thing you have to think about is that because the administration operations are on the same network as, as the regular cluster operations, then if an administrator is installing a new key, the fact that they're sending that new key over to the monitor to get installed, that actually gets sent over the network and could be sniffed. So we want to be careful um, of that. Um, so we, we can extend the current CephX protocol to add these per session encryption keys and enable that by default, either in um, situations where clusters want to trade security for performance, um, or just in those select situations where you have an administrator traffic that's, that's sort of critical and not performance sensitive at all. Um, denial of service attacks obviously are a problem for, for lots of systems, um, and Ceph is no exception here. Um, so today you can limit the load from an individual client um, by, for example, using key throttling um, to some level, but there's sort of a limit to what you can do on that side. Um, on the server side, eventually you need to think about how you can harden it against um, people who are trying to use too many resources. So the, the list of things we can do there are pretty simple. You know, we want to limit the number of connections that a, that a single OST can handle. At some point, it'll just start refusing connections instead of bogging itself down and, and destroying service. Um, you could, ideally, we'd want to limit that on a per host IP um, or client IP basis so that if there's a single attacker couldn't do that, they'd have to mount a distributed denial, denial of service attack before they could be successful um, to raise the bar. Um, and ideally, we, it would be nice if we could also throttle operations on a per session basis, uh, but that's, that's a bit more challenging. So um, that's, that's another key direction we want to go in. Um, finally, I want to just talk a bit about CephFS because it's a bit, a bit of a different situation than the, the block and object services. So, um, and the, the challenge here is that there's no sort of standard virtualization layer. So with a block device, if you have this virtual disk idea, then the, the hypervisor is actually giving you a lot of protection. That's not true with the file system. Um, so you can use proxies through NFS as one approach. Um, there's this 9P VertFS thing that is a feature of KVM that you can use. Um, or you can just have the tenant network actually talking directly to the storage services, which sort of um, immediately gets to the point where you have to rely on Ceph security. Um, but unfortunately, doing the, granu the granularity of access control is much harder there because there's no simple mapping from this complex directory hierarchy to the names of objects and the radios capabilities that would restrict you that way. Um, so there's a lot of work that's going on in the CephFS community to actually improve the, the, the Ceph's ability to restrict access um, on a per subtree basis or on a per client basis and so forth. Um, but that's all work in progress. So things like root squash and restricting to subtrees and users and so forth is stuff that we're working on over the summer and we hope to have in place for the next um, either this next release or the release after that um, for the next sort of iteration of, of stable deployment versions. Um, but so those are all sort of pre um, preemptive things. Um, assuming you actually are, there is a breach, you know, how do you deal with it? Um, so one of, the, one of the key things we did this year was um, create a new email alias, security at ceph.com, which is where you know, any reports about security flaws in Ceph can go. This goes to a restricted set of Ceph developers, and it also copies all the distribution security lists so from Red Hat, Canonical, and SUSE. They all get copies of this so that they can start their processes and so forth. Um, as a community, we prioritize security backports and, and fixes, of course, and make sure we, we push out releases as needed to do so. Um, and we, we can send announcements out to the, to the public lists. 
Um, I can only really speak about Red Hat Ceph as far as what happens on the product side, um, but it's, um, you know, this is one of the things that distributions um, like Red Hat are really good at. So they have a, a dedicated team of security professionals who, who deal with these sorts of issues. They, they drive the CVE process and make sure that it gets escalated and that they do all the, you know, check all the boxes and do all the tests and so forth, and then they can push this out to customers quickly so that the, the flaws are mitigated. And you can see these, these sorts of things in action when you have flaws like um, um, heart bleed and so forth. Um, the distributions really shine, shine in dealing with those types of situations. Um, you can also just um, implement general practices that allow you to detect and prevent these breaches in the first place. So, you know, things like people trying to brute force your authentication where they're just sending you random keys, we can implement mechanisms on the Ceph side that will sort of notice this brute force attacks and, and blacklist it. Um, have really good logging so that you can actually tell this and raise alerts in your, your system that you have, you know, some number of failed attempts from this IP and that you should go investigate. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, sort of the, again, the key management is the, the, the keys to the kingdom. That's sort of the, the key to keeping all of this safe. Um, in, a, in a paranoid environment, you can have, you know, can periodically audit the, the set of keys that are installed on the system to make sure that people aren't surreptitiously installing new keys and using, using that to subvert the system. Um, and so with that, um, we have a few conclusions. Um, sure. So, so in general, at a high level, we find that we have sort of reactive processes are in place. In place, we have the security notification email lists, and we're, we're sort of wired into all the distributions. And we've, we've done this a few times, so we know sort of what how to react to, to security vulnerabilities when they're when they're when they happen. Um, the hard part is all the proactive measures. You know, how do we actually prevent them in the first place? So, again, key the key is code quality, and we we're using. Um, SCA heavily and so forth to actually try to prevent these bugs and detect them when they get introduced. Um, um, we're working on doing unprivileged demons. This is going to be in the next step release um, and mandatory access control like SE Linux and AppArmor to make sure that um, if you do breach um, that you, you can't do further harm. Um, and, and things like encryption used selectively in places where it's, where it's really critical. Um, there's been some progress um, defining security best practices. Um, the key thing here is that we need to improve the documentation and actually, um, so it's clear that if somebody is trying to set up a cloud and is actually thinking about security, um, they have some documentation that will give them a good reference and they know what to do there. Um, but the, I think that the, one of the biggest takeaways is that this is an ongoing practice, you, a process. You can't just sort of fix all the issues and say that, you know, Ceph is now secure and you're done and then move on to something else. It's, it's ongoing diligence by the, the community and users, both users and developers, to make sure that you don't introduce new flaws and that you're continually staying on top of things. So um, everybody, one of the key things that you can do to help is to get involved. Um, so security and OpenStack is obviously a hot topic. Um, there's a telco working group that is dealing with a lot of these critical issues. Um, and all the different projects have, have specific security issues that they're addressing. And obviously in Ceph, that's, that's no exception. So you can get involved on the mailing list in IRC, and, and we have these um, online Ceph developer summits every three months where developers congregate to online to discuss what's going to happen for the next release cycle. Um, so. I think that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. There's, there's sorry, there's a microphone right over there, if you don't mind. <laughs> Okay, I have one question. I saw earlier that you are using dmcrypt to, uh, for address encryption. What, uh, what were the reasons for using dmcrypt over using encrypt, already encrypted hard disks from a couple of different manufacturers? Um, mostly simplicity. So dmcrypt will work on sort of any architecture. Um, there is, a, as, as I understand it, there's a semi-standard interface for doing um, encryption at the hardware level and the firmware, um, but the question is just how do you interact with that firmware and make sure that you properly detect it, the support and actually do it. The, the tooling isn't as easy. Um, okay, so, thank you. Yep. That would definitely be a nice project for somebody who wanted to improve the state of things. Yep. So the question goes to uh, Danny, but uh, Sage, I'd... Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion. Um, you mentioned earlier in the presentation about uh, separation through RADOS pools. Do you or would you also advocate taking that down to the OSD through the crush maps and say separation by pool by OSD to take it a step further or is that unnecessary? 
uh, I wouldn't do it because it takes a lot of flexibility. Uh, hard mapping that is uh, something that is uh, near to having separated hardware cluster, uh, physical configuration on, hard, uh, on the level of a complete cluster that is uh, nearly the same at the end and uh, it wouldn't uh, bring that much benefit and takes, takes only flexibility. Yep, yep, I would agree with that. I mean, even if you're separating it across OSDs, if they're on the same hosts and you compromise the less secure OSD, then you're on the same host and you can get at all the stuff that the other OSD is doing. So at the time that you're separating across hardware, you might as well be running separate clusters. Okay. Part of the reason I asked is because it's been advocated to separate OSDs across pools that, uh, that work on different workloads. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if you'd advocate that in security zones as well. It makes a lot of sense for performance reasons, doing different types of hardware, different speeds of disk. Um, for security, it's, the benefits are limited, I would say. Hi, I've got one question regarding network encryption. Have you mm -hmm. given any thought to just using, you know, given that Ceph is fully IPv6 enabled, just using the built-in encryption of the network layer, or why are you pursuing building your own? Um, that, would be, that would be one option. Um, honestly, this isn't something that um, a lot of sort of design and engineering attention has been spent on just yet. So I think that the, the issue with using um, like IPv6, IPsec would be that it's, no, uh, yeah, yeah. I think we just need sort of a, a network person to, to tell us what the best, the best thing would be there. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.